I believe in all of Christianity that we are living in one of the most exciting times to be a child of God. Hi, my name is Paul Goff, pastor at Wedgefield Baptist Church in Wedgefield, South Carolina. And we would like to take a moment to invite you to view our broadcast every Tuesday night at 8 o'clock. And if you don't have a church home, we invite you to come visit us here at Wedgefield Baptist Church to see what the Lord is doing and how he's moving and how his spirit is in this atmosphere of worship. Stay silent. I will not hold back. I want to open up and let the things roll out. I'm overwhelmed by your love, your faithfulness at all times. When my heart was hurting, it made things all so right. I'm never gonna stop, never gonna stop. I want to shout it out that I love Jesus. Tell the world that God is good. Sing a song that makes me happy. Shout out loud that God is good. I cannot stay silent. I will not hold back. Want to open up and let the things roll out. I'm overwhelmed by your love, your faithfulness at all times. When my heart was hurting, you made things all so right. I'm never gonna stop, never gonna stop. I want to shut it out. to see you all in the house of the Lord this morning. I appreciate Separate and uh, the wonderful job that they did for us this morning as well. And uh, we've had a good time already, haven't we? Yeah. I tell you what, the Lord's in this place. We've got some visitors back there. We've been around here crying. Y'all probably think we need to go see a psychiatrist or something. We've been uh, in the spirit this morning already, but it's okay. It's good. It's good. It's good when God blesses us. Amen? Yeah. I tell you what, I come to get a blessing. I don't know about you. Uh, and, uh, and I expected to see one and get one, and I've already done that. And I just appreciate all of you who let God use you uh, to minister back to our hearts. Thank you for, for being available. And if you're available, he'll make you able. Amen. So thank you very much. Okay. I was going to preach, or thinking about preaching, on the subject of giving and tithing. We spent a few weeks talking about faith, and by faith Moses, and, and, and dealing with how important it is that you and I be a people of faith, and how that we accomplish things and have God's power uh, according to our faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. We spent a few weeks talking about faith, 
um, we spent a few weeks talking about worship and how we pursue God in our worship. And the very first point in that message on worship was how we worship God in our giving. And uh, so we wanted to share a few thoughts with you about that. But then the Lord placed another sermon on my mind. And I said, Lord, I don't want to preach that one either. I don't want to preach the one about giving. We, just, we don't like to do that, but it's necessary sometimes that we do that. Uh, we have to be a giving people. God loves a cheerful giver. Uh, but when you start talking about people's, people's uh, wallets, then uh, you know, they'd rather talk about God's love or faith or worship. But leave my pocketbook alone. But uh, somebody says you can judge where an individual is at by looking in the checkbook and seeing where they're spending their money. I love the thought for today that says God does not, uh, how does it go here? God doesn't measure giving by the amount that you give, but rather by the amount you keep. God loves a cheerful giver. God also loves a sacrificial giver. And folks, if we don't give uh, to God's work, then it will not move forward. Um, it, it takes God's people. It takes finances to be able to support ministries. And if we don't give, and by the way, for those of you who do give and, and go beyond giving and tithing, to, to giving sacrificially to all of you who make this ministry happen. I want to say thank you. I don't tell you enough. Um, I wish to get to the place to where I could, could maybe write letters to you. Just telling you how much we really do thank you. But at this point, I don't know who gives what. And it's always kind of been my philosophy to not, who, not know who's giving what. So that I wouldn't, uh, in my flesh, treat anybody any differently. The Bible says God's no respect of person, and I hope we would be that way, but sometimes maybe we wouldn't, so I'd rather just not know at this point. That may change at some time. I don't know who gives what, but for those of you who do, I want to say thank you very much. And to those of you who do not, let me express to you um, that you are losing out on God's blessings. Um, tremendously so. The Bible teaches that. The Bible, listen, it's not an option. God commands us to give. It's not your option whether you want to give or not. God says to give your tithe. In other words, your tithe. Give your tenth unto the Lord. That belongs to Him. That's not yours to keep. And so, therefore, if we're not giving our tithe, then we're robbing. We're stealing from God. And then that's another problem altogether that uh, is going to quench the Holy Spirit. And is going to quench His work. Because if we can't afford ministries, those ministries will shut down. Okay, and we won't be able to do the things that we're currently doing if we don't give. And then there's this other message he gave me. I didn't want to speak about that either. But uh, got to do it. Got to preach the whole counsel of the Word of God. I can't just preach the pretty stuff. And I know, I know a lot of times I don't, but I try to stay away from these things. But I, I believe that some of us fellows come from a long line of unpopular preachers. And um, I maybe think the Lord chose me to be one of those guys. But the preachers in the Bible weren't always popular men. And they didn't always preach on popular subjects. As I think about Jeremiah, as I think about Nehemiah, as I think about Noah, uh, those men preached on God's wrath. Those men preached on coming judgment. And it's in the book. And uh, we've got to preach the whole book, Miss Kathy. We can't just preach the pretty stuff, the stuff that makes us leave here feeling good about ourselves all the time. Now, I'm all for that pretty stuff, believe me. I'm all for the love of God. No greater love has this than a man lay down his life for his friends. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But God commendeth his love toward us. Hearing his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. And, and all of those things, I'm all about that. And I thank God for his love for you and I. I thank God that nothing that you and I have ever done or will do can change his mind about how much he loves us. He loves us regardless of who we are. He loves us regardless of where we've been. He loves us, period. That's the way he is. The Bible says God is love, and I'm all for that. Amen? I'm all about the grace card. Amen? I'm all about graceful by grace. Are you saved? I'm all about those things. I love to preach them. I'd love to preach about grace and salvation every single time I got in the pulpit. And I'd love to make you feel good. And I'd love to make you feel all warm and fuzzy when you left every time. But amen, the preaching of God's word brings conviction upon our hearts. 
And sometimes we need to hear the truth. I like the way Jude said it. He's talking about two different styles of preaching here. He said, and of some have compassion making a difference. Now that's preaching the love stuff. That's preaching the Calvary stuff, the good stuff. But listen to the next verse. He said, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. That's two different styles of preaching. That's the love preaching that we hear a lot of, and that's the hellfire and brimstone preaching that we used to hear a lot of. Some people get saved by that love preaching, and some people you got to scare the hell out of them. I hope you got that on camera. I meant what I said, but that's what the Bible teaches. All right? So we got to preach the whole council so we can reach the whole group so that all men everywhere can have an opportunity to receive this great salvation. Now, this is going to seem like a contradictory of terms because the choir just sang forever, God is with us, and then we titled this message, When God Gives Up. Huh, wow, that seems like a contradictory in turns, doesn't it? Well, just so you'll know that I'm not giving you some hogwash, turn to Romans chapter 1. And I'll let you read it for yourself. I'm going to read it very slowly. You read it with me. It does a pretty good job all by itself. At showing the condition of the hearts of mankind. Romans chapter 1, we'll begin reading with verse, with verse 20, and we'll read all the way down to the end of the chapter. Very slowly, you read with me and hear the word of the Lord as you'll stand in your places. Verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. When you and I see creation and all the wonderful things that God made, There's something down deep in our hearts that tell us there was a creator. That's what the scriptures are saying. Verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise... The Bible said they became fools, and they changed the glory of God, the incorruptible God, into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Notice verse 24 says, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to the sign of their own bodies. Between themselves. This is the Apostle Paul here. And what he's saying is unpopular. He's in Rome. These people are living like the devil. And he's preaching this sermon and it's not popular. But they needed to hear it. Who changed the truth of God into a lie. And worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Notice verse 26. For this cause God gave them up. Unto vile affections for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burning their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. Notice verse 28. And even as they did 
not like to retain God in their knowledge. God gave them over. Third time, God gave up. To a reprobate mind. That word reprobate theologically means beyond salvation. No hope. They can't get saved because God gave up. That's scary. That's scary, folks. That's three times we've read already where the Bible says there is a time, there is a place, there are people who God will give up on. That's a scary thought to me, in my mind anyway. Anyway, over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all, now listen, being filled with all unrighteousness, it just gets worse and worse. It's just going down, 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 spiraling down, isn't it? Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable and merciful. Listen to verse 32. Who knowing the truth of God, or who knowing the judgment of God, rather, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but they have pleasure in them that do them. You may be seated. Pray with me, please. Father, in your lovely name, we come and we thank you, Lord, for the privilege to be in your house. Father, we thank you for the whole counsel of the word of God, the good, the bad, the ugly. None of those things refer to you or your word, but rather to mankind. And Father, Lord, as we enter into thy precepts, I pray that you'd give us understanding. And Lord, you know we'd rather not preach on this subject. I imagine Paul would rather not pin it down. There's nothing fun. There's nothing smart elecky about the things that we are about to say. And Lord, even as graphic as some of it may be, Lord, I believe this nation needs to hear this kind of preaching. I believe for a long time now we've headed down the road in the wrong direction. Dr. R.G. Lee, thy servant, used to preach a message entitled Payday Someday. Speaking of the judgment of God coming upon men and their wickedness and in their immorality. And God, I believe the bills are due. Father, help your church. Help your spotless garment that has been bathed in the blood of Jesus to see the need to stand for righteousness. Father, I believe we live in a day, Lord, that we have decided to go along to get along. Lord, I believe we have let the walls down. And I believe rather than standing against, we are standing with. I believe we're living in a time where you can't tell the difference between the church and the world. And I believe God will stand before you and give an account of ourselves. So, Father, I pray now that you would speak through us thy words. Let them not be my opinions, but rather thy words, words of truth. And allow us to receive it that way. And act upon it. James said, to be not only hearers of the word, but doers. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Three times in the text that you and I just read, the scriptures say that God gave them up. Or that God gave them over. But what that means 
really is that God gave up. And that phrase means that God abandoned, that God forsook, that God turned them over to another, that God deserted these people because of the choices that they made having to do with morality and immorality. I would hate to think, in my mind it's an awful thought, that the very God who created me the very God who sustains me, the very God who makes me able, the very God who gave his life for mine, that there is a certain time when he would give up on me and you. That's a scary thought to me, that God would give up on us. But the Bible teaches there comes a time and there comes a place when God will give up. You may say, well, what about God's grace, and what about His love, and what about His long-suffering, and what about His mercy, and all those other sermons you teach about how much God loves us anyway. I told you earlier, I absolutely believe those things are true, but even all, God Almighty, as much as we do not desire to say it, has a limit. He has a limit. There comes a time when God Almighty says, enough is enough. When God Almighty says, I give up, Proverbs 21 says, He that being often reproved and hardeneth his neck shall be suddenly cut off and that without remedy. In other words, you won't fix it. There's no cure. You'll be cut off. God will turn his back on you. The Holy Spirit won't come your way anymore. He won't knock on your heart anymore. That's a scary thought. That God will say, I'm done with you. And there will never be a chance for you to get saved again. I believe there's some people like that in this world. There may be some people like that in this church. I don't know. I certainly hope not. For your sake, I hope not. But our text today, we find the awfulness of the human condition. Now, I don't have to sit here today and try to prove to you that the human condition, as you and I know it today, is just plumb awful. Unless you live somewhere in a cave all by yourself and you have no availability to media or newspaper or anybody talking about it, there's no way you can deny that we're in trouble. There's no way you can deny that we've got problems. There's no way that you can sit there and not say that our immorality is spiraling down to the depths, the deepest dark depths of hell. You know it. I don't have to try to convince you. Of that, you know it. Particularly if you're here today and you've lived 40, 50, 60 years, you knew what things were like back then. You know how different they are and how far away from that that you and I have gotten today and how far away we'll be in 5, 10, 15 more years if Jesus don't come back. I hate to think what it'll be like in 20 years. I hate to think about what my daughter would see, what my children would go through, what your children would see, what your children would go through. I hate to see it. It's going to be Mardi Gras every day, all day long. Men with men, women with women doing that which is unseemly, changing the natural affection into that which is unnatural, reversing the order of God, reversing the way God created things to be. Folks, that's bad. You study the scriptures and you study history and all down through the ages there comes a time when God says that's enough and judgment comes to those people. Yes, I believe in love and mercy and grace and long suffering. But there is a such thing as the wrath and judgment of God and I always get this. What about, listen, He's a God of love. He's a God of of patience. The Bible says His mercy endures forever. Absolutely. But you've got to understand all of the character of God. And none of those attributes go against the other. He's a God of love. That's why He came and died for you, old rebel. He's a God of mercy. That's why you're sitting here breathing today. He's a God of grace. That's the only way any of us get saved. He loves us. God's riches at Christ's expense. He's done everything He could to get us out of this dilemma. And He's done enough. 
Okay? But that same God of love, that same God, that almighty, wonderful God, that God of justice, that God of righteousness and holiness. You see, because sin is so awful, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Right? Sin has a penalty. And because God is just and righteous in all that He does, He must see that sin be rewarded. He must see that debt be paid. And that's what Calvary is all about, you see. When you look at Calvary, it's not just about a mean old bunch of Roman soldiers trying to kill somebody. That's not what it was about at all. Because you and I were there that day. We may not have been there in person, but those old sins that you and I commit, they were there that day. And they rested upon Jesus Christ. And what we saw at Calvary was the wrath of God raining down upon Jesus. Now those of you and I who accept what Christ went through, Him receiving that wrath, Him taking that cross for us, Him taking that penalty for us, Him taking that scourging and that flogging for us, our cross, our sin, our death, our hell, He took it for us. That was the wrath of God. That's what that was about. He was making the score even. He was taking care of the debt of sin that you and I have caused. He was paying the bills at the expense of Jesus Christ. That was God's wrath. You see? And so those of you who have been to the cross and you've knelt and you've received that justification that Jesus Christ offers, you won't have to worry about God's wrath. You say, he that believeth on the Son hath life, John 3, 36. But he that believeth not the Son hath not life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. If you don't accept the wrath that God gave Jesus, he's going to put it on you one day. And it won't be no letting up. It'll be for all eternity, age Upon age, world upon world, no ending, forever, for all eternity. You see, God is a God of love and mercy, but He's also a just God who will reward the good and the evil. That's the part of God's character that we got to know. But that's the part of God's character, that ugly part that I just mentioned, that we've lost. Affiliation to because people get offended. They get frightened. They leave the house of God somewhere between the house of God and, and the huddle house or the golden corral. Conviction sets in and they say, I'm not going back over there anymore because I don't like feeling this way. They'd rather have the cotton candy stuff. I'll give you some cotton candy next week, but today we got to do what we got to do. In our text today, we find, I like the way Dr. Donald Bonhouse said it. He said, the pa this passage of the Bible is the most terrible passage in all the Bible. It's the most awful, it's the most frightening, it's the most awesome and shocking passages of Scripture in all the Bible that God gives up. God gives up. You see, we've softened that message. We've softened that lesson. We've, we've made it more pretty and we've made it more convenient for ourselves. J.B. Phillips says, they gave God up, so God gave them up. And here is the absolute truth, he says. And when men lose God, men always lose themselves. When we get away from God and we deny His truth, we will lose ourselves. We'll lose our standard. We'll lose our values. We'll lose our morality when you and I get away from God. What a frightening thing that should be to all of us today. The downward progress of human race as we move further and further and further away from God and from His truth and all that is right, all that is pure, all that is godly, all that is clean. The further we get away from God, the worse it gets and it gets worse and worse and worse, deeper, deeper, deeper into moral depravity. And that's where we are. You say, why? It's pretty simple. Why 
are we in the shape that we're in today in America? How do we get here with legalizing abortion? How do we get here with legalizing homosexuality? How do we get here with all of these things that we see every day? How do we get here? It's pretty simple because we got further and further and further and further away from God. That's what it is. Kids used to go to school, say the Pledge of Allegiance, say the Lord's Prayer. You know all this stuff. You see it. You hear it. But it's the truth. We've gotten away from it. I love you, Keith. And because we've gotten away from it, we are suffering the consequences today. Moral values are totally upside down. Listen to verse 21 again. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but they became vain. That means futile. That word means futile. They became worthless. They got so far away from God, they became worthless in their thoughts. Their minds were on evil continually. And they became indifferent to the truth, the Scripture says. Their minds became confused. Their hearts became darkened. And they can no longer tell the difference between right and wrong. It's scary. Three times. Three times. God said, I'm done. And listen to the three things he says. After the idolatry part, we get into the three reasons. The first one is a widespread of sexual immorality. But after the idolatry part, the Bible says that they love, they love the creature more than the creator. That's idolatry. Anything you love more than God is an idol. Right? But people love each other and they love themselves. We live in that kind of society. We, we, we are infatuated with the human body. How many of us got cable? Just go ahead and tell the truth. How many of us got satellite? Just go ahead and tell the truth. How many of us got a TV? Just go ahead and tell the truth. I don't know how many channels you got, but I guarantee you 75% of whatever channels you got on whatever kind of broadcast you got, I guarantee you they got a lot to say about the human body. How many of you are doing P90X? <laughs> don't raise your hand. <laughs> Weight watchers. It's all about beauty products and, and, and facial products and hair products and how to lose weight, how to lose weight, how to lose weight. We need to lose weight, but we're infatuated with the human body. That's idolatry. Right? We love the creation more than we love the creator. And we're caught up in those things. We're caught up in all the beauty products. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those things necessarily, but look at society and how much influence and how much attention it gives to humanity. You see what I'm saying? Those things are so important to us, but we become infatuated with it, even to the point of this widespread sexual immorality. I don't know if you want to listen in the next few minutes to this or not. You're welcome to get up if you don't want to. But I'm going to say some things that, that they're, pretty, they're pretty graphic. All right? Don't get mad at me. You sit around and watch it all day on TV. Don't tell me not to let your children watch when you let them watch it at home. Stage one, widespread sexual immorality. So let's gauge us in America today by stage one. Where are we with sexual immorality? Sex has become the thought for today. People wake up with it on their mind. They go to bed with it on their mind. Somebody in here will be affected soon by sexual immorality. Somebody listening to me today will be Perhaps you are being or you have already been affected by sexual immorality. Now let me explain that to you just a little bit. 
I'm getting nervous because I know some of y'all packing. I'm <laughs> we'll talk about pornography. You can go in almost any convenience store, and it's there on the shelf. The devil has a plan in such a way that you've got to walk by it to get almost anywhere in the store. You've got to walk by it to get out. Kids have got to walk by it to get the candy rack. Go look at it. Go pay it attention. Kids got to walk by it to go to the candy rack. Don't know anything about it, but they walk by it. That stuff's supposed to be covered up, and half the time it isn't covered up. And you walk by there, maybe having never seen one of those images, and you see one of those images, and you never lose that image in your mind. The devil plants it there forever, and you've got to live with it. Tempted and tried by Satan with one image. The problem with that image for most people is that one look is not enough. They want to go back and get another look, and so that's when they begin the journey of immorality. And the Bible says they burn in their lust one toward another. You can't look at that stuff. It's going to affect you. I don't, Moses would have been affected by it. Noah would have been affected by it. Jeremiah would have been affected by it. Paul would have been affected by it. Pastor Paul would be affected by it. You'll be affected by it. The devil knows that, so he plants it there. Videos. You go to the video store. You, watch, you can try to watch a clean movie, and you wind up seeing things and images that you, you shouldn't have seen and you wish you didn't see. The Internet, one button away from anything you want to see. All the immorality you can think of, I'm talking about including children, including homosexuality, men with men, women with women, groups with groups. I'm talking about high schools. I'm talking about colleges. I'm talking about our children involved in that same stuff. I told you. We are living in a time right now to where it's cool for girls to be with girls in high school. And if you're not one of those, it's not cool. We're living in a time to where young women, I ain't got my phone with me, young women are taking pictures of themselves nude and sending them by way of cell phone to boys who are viewing them and boys who are taking pictures of themselves and sending them to your girls who are viewing them. Sexting. And boy, it's so easy to do and nobody knows anything about it but God. And this is happening. There are people in here right now today doing it. You say, preacher, surely nobody in the Baptist church would do anything like that. It might be worse here. But it's here. And it's wicked, and it's evil, and it affects us. Brother Avon and I went and ate dinner this week at a restaurant here in town. And this is going to be bad. This is going to be bad. I'm warning you right now. You get up and leave, but I'm, I'm just telling you the truth, okay? We were in a restaurant, a public restaurant here in town. We were eating a meal, and we were talking about Jesus. I mean, we had got to talking about Jesus so much that he was crying, and I was crying. And we was having a good old time in the Lord. And there was a TV in this restaurant. When we first got in there, it was on a vacuum cleaner commercial. And I had a thought right then. I said, you reckon they think we want to sit here and watch a vacuum commercial while we're eating? Why can't they put it on the news or ESPN or something, you know, besides a vacuum, a sharp vacuum or whatever. But anyway, then the next thing I know, I'm going to say what it was. It was the days of our lives that come on. Oh, my God, I know some of y'all watch that. I'm going to get in trouble right here. And you saw it. You saw it. You're going to know what I'm talking about. You're going to say, yep, I know he's telling the truth now because I saw it. But anyway, they were in there having a photo shoot with a man and a woman, and both of them was naked. Avon, Brother Avon, am I lying? You just sang that. Don't be lying. <laughs> but, and, and, they were, and they were loving up on each other like two dogs in heat. That wasn't the worst part. The worst part was the four women over in the corner watching them who got all hot and bothered watching it. Wow, we were eating dinner in a public restaurant at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. If I'd had Allie with me, she'd have saw it. If I'd had Colby with me, he'd have saw it. If we'd had Brendan with us, he'd have saw it. If I'd have had my wife with me, she'd have saw it. And so, fellas, I'm telling you right now, if your wife's sitting around the house watching it, 
You better watch out. You can't watch that kind of field and not be bothered by it. I'm just saying. I know I'm in trouble. God called me to tell you the truth. I told you I'd be honest with you. You know that stuff ain't right. You know in your heart of hearts that that stuff ain't right. And I don't know anybody in here and if you watch it or not. But I, I'm just saying, when you can sit in a public restaurant in the middle of the afternoon and see that kind of garbage on TV, something is wrong. Something is wrong. And so here's the big problem with that. One out of every two marriages, it ain't a big deal today. But I promise you one thing, my friend, when your wife walks out on you, it's going to be a big thing. I know. It's going to break your heart. It's going to crush your world. It's going to affect your children. It's going to affect you for the rest of your life, regardless of how it goes. One out of two marriages end in divorce. There's a lot of us in here today that way. Most of the time, that happens because of sexual immorality. Somebody was unfaithful, or somebody got an idea ahead that the grass was green on the other side, and they decided to venture out and find it. I'm just telling you, boy, it's quiet in here. God... I'm not trying to be cute, folks. It's going to hurt you when it happens. I don't want you to hurt. A lot of the things on our prayer list have to do with that. People are hurting. People are seriously hurting. Their world has been turned upside down. And the root of it is sexual immorality. And I want to help you. I'm trying to tell you the truth. That is no kind of business for a Christian to be involved in. Here's the problem. Here's, the, here's, here's, here's another part of that, Brother Chris. It, it's in the church. It's in the church. Preacher, that stuff couldn't happen in the church. What's the address of that cave you live in? So I can come visit with you. That immorality leads to stage two, and i got to go. You see, the flesh don't get enough. The flesh is never, ever satisfied. Allow no provisions for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. It is never, ever satisfied, and you'll have to do more and more to quench its desires. So the next thing that happens here is called open homosexuality. There was a time that was not acceptable. Today it's common. I'm not supposed to be preaching on it. Somebody out there will hear about it and I'll be in trouble again. Every time I say one thing about it, I get in trouble. I'll get in trouble again. But I'd rather get in trouble here now than get in trouble when I stand before God. Amen? Uh, all right. Amen. Listen to the Apostle Paul 2,000 years ago. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error. Which was meat. Now I want to make this very, very clear to you. This pastor right here does not hate homosexuals. This pastor right here will never run one off from the church. I love that person, but I hate and I despise that sin. And that's the way you and I have to approach it. Because God will judge that sin regardless of who it is. And some of us have those kind of people in our families. And we love them, don't we? And we care about them and we pray for them and we pray the Holy Ghost will prick their hearts and change them of their wicked ways. Oh, it's going to get good here in a minute. Hold on a minute. But see, we want to blame it on everything else. We want to blame genetics. We want to blame the absence of fathers or the overprotectedness of mothers or, or child abuse or early sexual confusion, I think is one of the things they call it. There's all kind of excuses, but I believe, regardless, it's still a willful choice. It's still a willful choice. It reverses the natural order of creation. The way God made it to be, it reverses God's plan. And I believe it falls right here into this. Paul was not condoning it right here, by the way. 
He's talking pretty bad about it. In fact, in chapter 2, verse number 2, he talks about, But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Go to verse 2. Chapter 2, read it. God ain't for it. Paul's not condoning it. It falls right here. And I believe it's unnatural and it represses the way that God made a person. It's degrading. It's, it's depraved. It's wicked. It's perverted. And God will judge it. Study Romans chapter 1 for yourself. It's a sign of a society that God has left to themselves. I was scared when I started this thing off. By the time I got to the end, I was more scared. Because we're there. What you and I are seeing is more than immorality. It's a sign of a society that God has left alone. Is there hope for America? Or is it too late? Have we crossed the line? Have we gone too far? That's a big question among preachers, among pastors. Is there hope? Are we too far gone? And there are those who say you will not find America in the book of Revelations anywhere because they're gone. I'll let them argue about that. I hope Jesus comes back first. So that spiral of immorality, it, it, sexual immorality, homosexual, number three, we, we, we're almost done, but it's, it's just unlimited and unrestrained evil. There's just no limits to it. There's no limits to how bad and nasty it can get. It's just no limits to it. And even as they did not like to retain God and their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do the things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, listen, it just goes worse and worse and worse. Being filled with all unrighteousness and fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable. We can preach on that for three years. All of these different things that these people are involved in who have gotten further and further and further away from God to the point that he says, I give up. Go on. Get on with your life. Live the way you want to. I give up. And I'll see you at the judgment. In verse 32. Who knowing the judgment of God. They know it's coming. They know it's coming. Who knowing the judgment of God. That they which commit such things are worthy of death. And they know of the second death. They know of an eternity without God. They know about hell. They know about the suffering. And the torment of that judgment. But they've gotten so far. They've been so blinded. Their hearts have been so hardened that they don't care. They do it anyway. And not only do they do the same the way that verse ends, but they enjoy watching other people do it. They have pleasure in them that do them. We love watching people doing things that are ungodly, don't we? How many hours do we spend in front of the television watching people get murdered? And then watching somebody try to figure it out. Watching men run around on their wives. 
We do that. And it's okay. But these verses, this says, it says it's not okay. These verses describe a world that God has left behind, that God is not involved in, that God said, go ahead. That scares me. He's abandoned. He's forsaken. He's deserted these kind of people. And then the third thing about that third stage is that's the final stage before social collapse. And you do your homework and you look, and, and, and I began doing that this week, but you look back at other great powers, other great nations, and you look at them and you watch what happened, and you look for them today, you can't find them. And right here's one of them, Greece. <laughs> they collapsed. You see, preacher, it would never happen to America. Yes, it will. Yes, it will. God would not be just if he allowed it to happen to Sodom and Gomorrah, but he didn't allow it to happen to us. God would not be sovereign and just if he allowed it to happen to Greece, but he didn't allow it to happen to us. It scares me. So the question must arise, where does society end up when it totally turns away from God? And I think that you know the answer. Wrongdoers, wrongdoers have taken control of our world. They've taken control of the media. They've, been, they've taken control of the educational system. I mean, they've taken control of legalizing their own wit. I mean, they, they, hey, they've done a pretty doggone good job, haven't they? But what about us? What about us? How long are we going to? Stand silent, afraid to address these issues that will bring judgment to our homes. I will stand before God. You will stand before God. We will give an account for not standing for that which is right and moral and pure. And for you and I to go along with it may even be worse. But I got some good news. I got some great news. I don't want to end it that way. Boy, y'all look pitiful. <laughs> I love 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 11. Listen to it. It's so pretty. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? That's these people we're talking about. Be not deceived. Neither fornicators nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. No way, not by any means, shall any of these people inherit the kingdom of God. But listen to what it says, and such were some of you. Y'all was just like them. Some of y'all were adulterers. Some of y'all were homosexuals. Some of y'all were perverted. Some of us, should I say, amen. Some, he said, and such were some of you, but here's the good news. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. And by the Spirit of our God, you've been made clean and you've been made whole. It's not too late. You and I cannot save a society. We cannot change a society. It'll never begin in a corporate setting. But you and I can be changed by the washing and regenerating of the Word of God. You say, preacher, why do you preach things like that? Because those things bring conviction which allows us to search out our hearts and find a remedy and find forgiveness and find cleansing in the blood of the Lamb of Jesus Christ. Amen. We can't change everybody, but you and I can. I don't know much about what you do when you're not here. Some of you. Some of you I know.
I don't know. I don't know. Don't want to know. But I know who does. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. He knows. He's keeping records. And he will make us pay the bills. There's a payday someday. You will stand in judgment in the face of Almighty God and give an account and be judged according to everything you've done, whether it be good or whether it be bad. That's a frightening thought. But if you're in this group who's rejected the blood, who's rejected the cross, who's rejected the Savior, you and I won't be at the same judgment. You'll be at the great white throne judgment, and that's not a good place to be. Because you won't get turned around from that one. It'll be too late to do anything about it. God will judge you, He'll sentence you, and He'll cast you out into eternity, doomed and damned forever. Under God's almighty wrath. Others of us who've accepted the cross and the blood and the works of Christ will be at the judgment seat of Christ, where the Bible says, There is now therefore no condemnation to them who are Christ Jesus. We'll stand there in robes of white, having been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, justified, justified, never sinned because of the blood of Jesus. Justification is the act of God whereby He loves us so much that He accepts the works of the cross as pure and final and satisfactory payment for sin. Why is it so important to preach the cross? Why is it so important to preach the blood so that poor old hell-bound sinners, reprobates, can come and be cleansed and be changed for the glory of God? That's what we preach. That's what Brother Ben and Haley was crying about when he was up here talking and praying just a little while ago. He was talking about what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I don't know you today, but I know there is a fountain rich and sweet. And I know today you can come and cast your poor soul at the Savior's feet. Find forgiveness under your souls. Be cleansed and changed. And that, my friend, is what this country needs. And that, my friend, is the only thing that will save her. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we ask that you help us to reach those who are listening and those we meet to come from the hedges and highways compelled to come to Wedgefield Baptist Church, not knowing why they're coming, but when they get here, they will not want to leave because they feel the Spirit of the Lord is at work here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.